17 and then Mark chapter 2. Thanks guys for moving up a little bit. That's a blessing. Now, as we prepare, yesterday morning I did a, a funeral and then yesterday evening I did a wedding. Uh, it's just like, and, but then before that we went and shot a couple pigs to get ready for the beast feast. You can't have a beast feast without the beast. Hey Amen, you got to have that. And we got a lot of other people cooking up stuff and preparing for next week. Uh, my friend, this is just an opportunity to reach people. This morning, my thought is, hello, crisis. A crisis is a difficult situation that needs serious attention. A difficult situation that needs serious attention. If I ask people, what is your crisis? I may get that somebody is in the hospital that is not doing well. For some people, they may have cut their finger and it won't stop bleeding. And for them, that's a crisis. Others would be even down to a hangnail. That could be a crisis. It's according to what you want it to be. When I look through the Word of God, though, I see this tremendous crisis of one word I could use called hell. Don't say it. I'll say it for you. Hell. You know, we say it all the time. I, w I came up with a, a family that um, our vocabulary was kind of limited. And because of that, my dad used the word hell all the time, but he never used it in a biblical sense. You know what I'm talking about? You know, if something was from hell, that means being the worst or most dreadful of a kind, like a vacation from, uh-huh. Those stuck on that ship right now, they own that. Hell on, that person is hell on wheels. I think my dad called me that once. We use the term to talk about difficulties of whatever kind of size. We use the term hell or high water. Dire consequences. They got hell to pay. I've heard the phrase, what the hell, so many times from church folk. I thought, boy, they're biblically sound. When Jesus used the word, it had to do with crisis. And this is where we're at today. As funny as some of these thoughts were, the crisis, the situation at hand, motivates me, drives me. The mission of this house is to win. Win the loss, integrate and nurture. To win the loss is to understand that not only is there a kingdom, not only is there a heaven, which we preach so much about, but I started looking through what Jesus talked about hell, and he was hammering this thing, man. He just, he, he wouldn't back off that there was a crisis to avoid. You being here today tells me that you're concerned about uh, love for God, love for people, love for this house. Amen. You have a, 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 an understanding that there is a heaven. But the first thought I had when I, as a young boy, though never going to church, was I picked up on this thing about hell and eternity and the crisis in this situation. Now, the thing is, is once you get born again, oftentimes you forget about it. November the 10th, 1979, I got born again. It's like, you know, okay, I, I've taken care of that. But in life, we've got to realize that as we move toward any event, the spring conference, the, the muscle car Sunday, the beast feast, Easter, everything that pushes ahead brings us toward this place to uh, help people understand that there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shine. Can I get an amen? Luke chapter 17, verse 26 says, Just as it was in the days of Noah, and here it is, Jesus speaking. We know that there's a big ark over in Kentucky. But the, that ark is a reminder of judgment and redemption. Amen. So also will it be in the days of the Son of Man. People were eating. They were drinking. That means rebel rousing, getting drunk, marrying and being given in marriage. Up to the day Noah entered into the ark. So now we know there was marriage before the ark. Up to that day, then the flood came and destroyed all of them. It was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, buying, selling, planting, building, and the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. Then Jesus goes on to say, that is also going to be like when the day of the coming of the Son of Man. When I come again, people are still going to be planting, they're going to be building, they're going to be married. In other words, life's going to be going on. So when that happens, we forget that the one mandate we got is a crisis that needs situation. Uh, this week, I've already been at the hospital. 
I was in the hospital the week before with a man who just passed away this week. I did a funeral, like I said, yesterday of a lady who had connected to our church. And went, as a matter of fact, I didn't recognize who it was because she lives out of town. But every time she came into town, she brought people to church. She wanted them to go to the little country church. She wanted them connected. And many of them people are still in our church. And I looked up and I saw her face. And I went, hey, look at this lady. It was her drive. It was her passion because she loved this house. Oftentimes, your problem will introduce you to your purpose. Amen. If, you, if you've gone through some type of difficulty in life, all of a sudden, hello, purpose. It'll connect you with that as you move through it. Mark chapter 2. Are you comfortable? I have preached this message, oh my goodness, how many times? 30, 40, 50 times? This same passage. And then I asked God, Lord, would you show me something different? And, something, and this is the neat thing about the Bible. I don't... I, I'll never forget the time I, I kind of cornered my dad right after I got born again. I, I cornered Pop, and I brought it up to him. Dad would have been, and he threw a little New Testament at me. He said, I done read this Bible. Just because you read it once, just because you read it twice. I had a dear friend that every time he would read a chapter, when it says chapter at the top of the Bible, he would circle the C, he would circle the H, he would circle the A, and he would t all the way until he finished that chapter as many times as it said chapter. Amen. He just read that Bible all the way through. You'll get more out of this book every time you read it. Mark chapter 2 tells us a few days later when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard they had come home. So many gathered there were no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came. They brought to him a paralytic carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus. And after digging through it, lowered the mat of the paralyzed man that was lying on. Then Jesus saw their faith. Everybody say their faith. He said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some teachers of the law, we call them haters. How many know there's always haters when it comes around the gospel? And people, they don't, they don't like what you're doing. They're haters. So here the haters are, teachers of the law, thinking of themselves. Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus in his spirit knew in his spirit what they were saying. Hmm. He, he could pick up their thinking. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say the paralytic, your son, son, sins be forgiven, or to say, get up, take up your mat, and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take up your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked down in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we've never seen anything like this. Now, I love this passage. There's so many nuggets, but it's finding the other nuggets, the other pearls that are in it. When they lowered that man down and he hit the ground, I, I, I can surmise that Jesus looked at him and said, Hello, crisis. Because here's a man who's a paralytic. He's unable to talk. He's unable to walk. He's been brought there by four guys. They ripped a hole in the roof and lowered him down. Oh, my goodness, would it be your house? Father, I love you. I thank you for the word of God. I thank you for the excitement, the thrill of knowing you and all the good things that come from you. Bless this opportunity for me to share in God in Jesus' name. And everybody shout. Amen. Amen. God bless you. you. may be seated. Again, those watching online, thanks for tuning in. One of the things I pick up on this passage, several of them, is first off, these four guys had a, a desire to see a man that was in a crisis brought to Jesus. They were friends. There is a fellowship of friends in life. John 13, 35 says, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one for another. The issue in life is simply this. Do you love people enough? To use your phone, to use your computer, to text, reach out, connect, get hold. Now listen to me. There's a difference in contacts and connections. I got a phone. My phone has probably close to 2,000 contacts in it. That's how many people that are contacted with me. But that don't mean we're connected. Connection is different. I go through there and I got another set of phone numbers. These are my connections. These are people I'm going to call, Steve. These are folk that I'm going to get in touch with if I need something or vice versa. My connections always call me. Contacts always bother me. You everybody follow me? So in life, you got contacts. And then many of you are sitting by your connections. You know there are people that you're connected to. That's important. These four guys were connected to this guy. They go after him in this, this situation. And if we, over the next six weeks, 
Don't reach out and connect with people and bring them in. We are missing opportunities. When that lady, when I walked in yesterday and I realized this is the lady that brought you to church and brought you to church, your kids are saved now, you're going to heaven now, you're missing hell now, this is important to me. And I know Jesus preached a lot about the kingdom. I love it. But he said a lot of stuff about eternal fire, not getting your stuff right, being cast out. In other words, to Christ, it was important that he came. You got to answer the question. You got to answer the question. If, if, uh, if you don't know Jesus, are you going to hell? And if that answer is yes, then we're all in a crisis. And I've done funerals for your friends and your family. And I've sat there and I've looked at the despondency on your face and the tears down your face when you realize I should have said something to them. God would use me to connect with them. And it's important. It's not just about filling the house. It's about emptying hell. Come on, somebody get a little excited for the preacher. You help me, I'll help you. Mm -hmm. I often don't do that. I wait on them other preachers to come here and tell you all that. It's a, it's a difficult situation. It needs some serious attention. So these four guys, they show up in this full house. The Scripture says that when Jesus entered there, the people heard that he had come home. So some think said it was his house. I think it was his neighborhood because one passage said it was, or one history teacher said it was Peter's house. Amen, that was there. But, but no one's exempt from this setback. When he got there, the house is full, couldn't get in. Oh, I wish somebody, I wish his house was so packed out that folk had to tear the roof off this place. Amen, coming through the back door, peeking over the baptistry. Hallelujah. And it can happen. It can happen. So here, here the house is full. Jesus is preaching. I always wonder what he's preaching. Is he preaching something like me? Uh, in other words, uh, a sermon he's preached before? The Bible says he opened his mouth and he preached. He is the Word of God. So anything he said was the Word of God. And he's preaching in the house. And the four get there and they got this setback. My friend, setbacks are, slows the progress in life. I, I, I told the band a while ago, I said, we're fixing to hit six weeks of powerful stuff. Prepare yourself, because when God's blessing, Satan's messing. Amen. Every level is another devil. And as we begin to move towards something, things are going to start happening. And your vehicles are going to break down. Kids are going to act up. Dogs are going to run off. Cats are going to stay. You're going to get new cats, I promise you. It's just going to be all kind of setbacks are going to start coming your way. So prepare yourself for it. There are all kind of setbacks. They're small. They're large. There's degrees of setbacks. Some cost. Some don't cost. There are diversities of setbacks. It causes us to relate. Amen. Health has set you back. Economy can set you back. Bad choices can set you back. But they had already made an investment. And when you invest in something, let me tell you what an investment is. When you've carried some dude on a mat, X amount of feet, yards, miles, and you get there, we getting in. We getting in. We're going to see this thing, man. We're going to make sure he gets in. And this guy, really, uh, uh, when you read the Bible, he ain't said nothing yet. He ain't said a word. It's just these four guys are determined. You get into the muscle car. So you get into the beast feast. You get into Easter. You're going to get to church next Sunday. I'm going to get you to the house. Because I tell you, Jesus is in the house. And if I can get you to the house, something's going to change in your life. Uh-huh. Again, many think this was Peter's house. It reminds me of my house. I never know who's fixing to come through the door. So some people would have said, well, you know, if it was God's will, there would have been room for him. You know, a couple weeks ago, I took a bike ride on my birthday. First thing I did when I backed the bike, I'd have dropped it. Sam just dropped it right there. Just, just dropped it. Just, it just fell right there. I ain't even got my glasses. Try to put my glasses on the bike. Drops right there. Well, that thing's six, seven hundred pounds. I can't pick it up. My son in law comes helps me pick it up. And you'd think to yourself, well, maybe God don't want you to go on that bike ride. Then next day I get to the gas station. The gas, the gas station ain't working. Wouldn't take my card. Wasn't working at all. So maybe God don't want me to go on this bike ride. I go down to the next gas station. It wasn't working. And I'm thinking, oh, maybe God don't want me to go on this bike ride. And then I bowed my back and I said, what is it going to take to stop me from going on this bike ride? Sometimes you've got to make up your mind. Hell or high water. I'm going on this bike ride. I'm going to get my friend to that church. I'm going to get him in there no matter what. Again, a crisis tells me I have something invested in this miracle. I've done something. I'm going to make sure this happened. They had a resolve to make it happen. Jesus honored their faith. The scripture says when Jesus saw their faith, not the man's faith, so maybe it's you. 
Maybe it's me that's got to get more faith, that's got to believe God that if I get you here, something's going to happen in your life. If I get my kids to the house, something's going to happen in life. It's going to be my faith that says it. I know that you, you ain't got no faith. You can't believe God for nothing. If the faucet comes on and water comes out, oh, then, then all of a sudden. But if it doesn't come out, you ain't got enough faith to go get bottled water out of the fridge. My faith. My faith says this thing can happen. Listen, when they hit that thing, they hit that wall, and they couldn't do anything with it. They couldn't get in the building. And then they climbed up, and somebody said, let's throw him up here on the roof. And that's probably one of them flat. I don't know. I don't think it had shingles on it. It's probably one of them mud huts. They put him up there on top. Sometimes you don't know you're an overcomer until you got something to come over. Jesus said we're going to be overcomers. We hit a little wall. We hit a little crisis. We hit a little snag, and we quit. You can't be an overcomer until you got something to come over. Amen. You've got to be able to move over it. We have these self-imposed limitations on our life. You know, for one people, that was the ceiling. That was as high as they're going to get. But for them five guys, those four guys in the paralytic, that ceiling, amen, became their floor. And they moved up on the floor. Some people live on the basement all the time. They never leave the basement. Your heart's broke for them. But you want to get on up and make that basement your floor. And you start moving up a little bit higher, a little bit higher. Don't let people keep you down. Can I get an amen? Small mindedness has to be broken in our churches. I remember when we, when we started the church out at the camp. You got, let me back it up. I remember a day I thought to myself, wouldn't it be cool to have a swimming pool? I'm going to tell you a few more. I said, wouldn't it be cool to have a Harley? Wouldn't it be cool to have a horse? Wouldn't it be cool to have a swimming pool? When I was young in ministry, I borrowed everybody's Harley. I rode everybody's horse, Sam. Hey, man, I swam in everybody else's swimming pool. And then I kept thinking that way. Next thing I know, we owned the swimming pool. We own the Harleys, we own the horses, we own the place. And now two churches? Small mindedness always keeps you in. You know, I was out visiting my friend David Hilton this week because for 17 years now, he's he been moving from rented place to rented place to rent, but now they got their own building. Man, my ch I, I, there's a video they're going to show out there. He warned me, to, I, couldn't, I couldn't make it. But David looks at me as his pastor. So I'm so excited for those folk out in Dayton because now they got their own building. They're not small minded at all. They're going to own their own place. And I said, David, I'm more proud of you, man, than a father could be to a son. I'm so excited for you, sir because you own your own place now. Your, your mind's not small. You, you got this expansion. And that's what's important in life. A crisis will push you to a miracle moment. Did you know when a woman is pregnant, she's in a crisis? If you don't believe it, just go in the delivery room and watch what happens. She'll slap you up the side of the head and blame you for everything that's going on. She has hit a situation the critical. Something is happening in there. When that baby gets in a certain place, a crisis moment, that baby's showing up. But when that baby gets here, and that baby has a crisis of, of uh, 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 let me, what's the word I'm looking for? Of, of hunger? That baby going to eat. That baby, that my baby won't eat. Let the baby get hungry enough. The baby eat. When that baby has a, a crisis of mobility, that baby going to start walking. And once they do, Pity the parent that thinks it's cool when that kid walks at nine months. Lock that kid down for about four years. Because, because crisis hits, amen, it moves. When a, butter, when a caterpillar goes through the metamorphosis of becoming a butterfly, it's a crisis that brings it out. When that chick's in the egg, I'll never forget, we, we had chickens, my granny had chickens coming up, and, and you, you wanted to help the chick out of the egg. It's something about we want to help, and that chick is pecking on that, and God equipped that chicken with a beak. He gave it a beak. And he gave you a gift to, and the ability to move through crisis, to be able to handle life. He gave you a beak so you can peck your way out of stuff. Amen. And that thing, a peck and peck, and it's important for it to strengthen itself to come out of there. The crisis is not a bad thing. It was actually a good thing. It was an indication you've outgrown your previous level. When we outgrew the church in, in New Caney, we bought the church over here in Crosby. We had outgrown our level. Now, crisis causes you to make this destiny decision. Decision. Motion creates emotion. The closer they got, the closer they got that guy to the house and they could hear Jesus preaching, the more excited they got. And motion was creating emotion inside of them. The issue in life is not, if not you, who? 
If not now, when? They get on top of that roof. And they begin to tear a hole in that thing. And I believe they begin to tear off things like prejudice and, 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 and uh, uh, apathy. Amen. And, and when he got there, the scripture says in Mark 2, that when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Hold on. This is where I get tripped up. I get tripped up here. If I drug you in, and you can't talk, and you're shaking, and your legs don't work, and I get you, you get in the house, and then Jesus says, Son, your sins are forgiven. Put yourself in his body right there and ask yourself, That ain't why I came. Come on, don't lie to me, don't get spiritual. You didn't show up to get saved. You didn't show up to miss hell. You showed up to get your legs back. Amen. And when Jesus said, son, your sins are forgiven. Ah, Jesus, I ain't my legs. I'm looking for I mean, ain't my salvation. And many times this is it. People don't, they miss eternity because of the crisis. They forget there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shine. And all they want is that need met. They want the refrigerator full. They want the gas tank full. They want the kids doing right. They want their legs working. They want their heart helping. But they forget the main thing. What's the main thing? That you get to heaven and miss hell. That's the main thing. So Jesus first deals with the main thing. Son, your sins are forgiven. Well, thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. And then them haters had to speak up and say, well, you know the truth about the matter here. Who do you think you are to forgive sins? Well, that's that moment where Jesus ripped his shirt off, showed the big S on his chest. <laughs> that stood for Savior, not Superman. All right, Savior. <laughs> Who do you think I am? So that you may know the Son of Man has power on this earth. I'm going to tell him to get up and walk. Son, get up and walk. He picked up his mat and walked away. Never seen nothing like it. Come on up, Mary. But well, here's the thing with this message. Jesus looked at this young man. And he said, Son, your sins, your issues... Your habits, your old life is forgiven. Rise up, walk, take your mat. A woman had an issue of blood for 12 years. She couldn't stop the bleeding. She reaches through the crowd and touches Jesus. And Jesus said, daughter, you remember this in Mark 5, 4, 5. Daughter. You're forgiven. Be whole. Go in peace. He gets in a room with a little girl who's 12 years old. And he says, young lady, rise up. He finds a man with a withered right hand in a crowd of church. Has him stand up and says, sir, stretch forth your withered hand. Now I'm reading this and it's jumping all over me. That we label people. According to their past sins, issues, habits, and mistakes. When you read the Old Testament, if I throw the word Rahab at you, your next thought, if you're a King James person, is harlot. If you're NIV, prostitute. Amen. You immediately label her. And she was labeled all through. If I throw a guy named Bartimaeus at you, you think of yourself blind. Bartimaeus. Jesus didn't name his name. The people named his name. When Jesus healed people, he often never used... You don't think he knew the name of that withered guy? You don't think you, he, the, the guy with the paralytic, you don't think he knew his name? You don't think he knew the woman that had the issue of blood for 12 years? Her name? He, he knew her name. You don't think he knew the little girl who's 12 years old? He, did, he didn't name them. There's a reason why. Because what happens, you know, if you've had an alcoholic problem, yes, alcohol, Al. Mm. Druggy Dave. Mm. Willie Weed. Y'all with the preacher now? 
We label people according to what they've come through in life. And we stick them with that and we hold that label on them until the rest of their life, all they're reminded of is their past. But when Jesus looked at them and he redeemed them, he said, son, he, I, I heard from kids in school, man. Right now they in school and, they, they, and, and that social media kicks out. And one mistake, boom, it's on the web. One mistake and it goes out to everybody. And they label that, that young lady a name simply because because of uh, one mistake. Or they labeled that young man a name because of one mistake. When God looked down at him, he said, you're my son, you're my daughter. I ain't labeling you by your past or your history. Your history doesn't determine your future. I see something different in you. And if you can't let go of your labels, you're going to walk through life dragging it. The paralytic, the withered, the blind. We spit in the eyes of the guy that was blind. Doesn't give his name. Doesn't say blind Bob. <laughs> Muddy face Mike. <laughs> he don't do that. He lets it go. The disciples one time showed up and they said, Jesus, you wouldn't believe, man, the devils, the devils move. When we call, when we cast out devils, they move at your name. People get healed in your name. Jesus said, Don't get so excited because you can do something out of my name. He said, Be excited that your name is written in heaven. See, the crisis, we miss it. We miss it. Healing's going to come after the salvation. Let me just mention this to you. Let me just say it like this. This man got more than he asked for. He showed up hoping to get a new legs, to get healed, and he ended up getting heaven. Amen. When I got born again, I got more than I asked for. I got peace. I got joy. I got, I got you as my family. I got more than I could ever ask for. Many times folks don't, they scared. They're like, somehow I'm going to give up something if I give my life to Jesus. Yes, you are. You're giving up hell. <laughs> preach, preacher, preach. Man, it's jumped all over me because I've seen our, our kids labeled. I've seen people go through life. And I was telling Pastor Mike, my pastor this morning, I said, Pastor, this message not so much for the people against for me. It's to remind me to quit labeling people because I was labeled. I was labeled as a young boy. I was labeled as a grown man. You go through life and people just try to label you. Amen. They try to remove from you the dignity of what God, son. When I hear him use the word son, what he's saying to that young man is you need a daddy. I'm your daddy. Daughter, I'm your daddy. There's something spiritual about understanding that you got a daddy. Do not define me, you or anyone, by the failures in their lives. Don't define me by my dysfunction. Mm -mm, mm -mm. The cross changed all that. The cross took all of that away. Amen. This church is ready through crisis. It seems like every year we get momentum going. Something happens. Two out of the last three years, we fought flood. You know, this place became a refuge for the other campus. So important to have. But this man... He got a promotion. He got more than he came for. When people meet Jesus, they get healing, mental stability, a new family. I don't know how I could have went through the crisis that I've been through in life with the past of my father, my sister, the heartaches, the pains, without my family, without support, without somebody caring. I don't know how people live without Jesus. I don't. And I know there's a hell to Sean. But the issue for me wasn't always the hell. It was the relationship with him. It's about heaven. It was getting more than I ever asked for. It's finding purpose and a hunger to help. In the words of Jesus, and this ain't on the overhead, Sister Kim, I threw this out. Because when I read it, I remind myself of a motivation of when I was a young man. I went to a concert in Huntsville, Alabama. A young man named Keith Green was on the stage. Keith was killed in a plane crash at age 28 with two of his children. But man, what a prophet of God. 
And as he stood on that stage by himself in a place, the auditorium was packed, the Von Braun Civic Center. And I'm just 19 years old. And he begins to read the Bible. He made a statement to the people. You didn't pay anything to get in. You don't have to pay anything to leave. Keith always did free concerts. And then he began to share the word. And it resonated inside me. When the Son of Man comes in His glory, it's Matthew 25, 31, and all the angels with Him, He will sit on His glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He'll put the sheep on His right, goats on His left. Then the King, Jesus, will say to those on the right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father. Take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry. And he gave me something to eat. I was thirsty. And he gave me something to drink. I was a stranger. And you invited me in. I needed clothes. And you clothed me. I was sick. You looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger, invite you in when you needed clothes? When did we see you sick and in prison and visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. We get so caught up in all this new worship. And I'm not putting it down. I'm just saying. I, I just see it going on. We get caught up in all of our heavenly moments. And we forget about winning the lost. We forget about reaching people. We forget about the mandate. I don't want to go through life with a label other than son. I, I, I want to make sure that if somebody lowered me through the roof that I honor those who led me to Jesus. That's why I always talk about Randy and Bubba. If it hadn't been for Randy and Bubba, I wouldn't stand here today. They took a chance on me, and they pursued me, and they got me to Jesus. we got to do the same. The king will reply, truly, I tell you, whenever, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers you did to me, verse 41, then he will say to those on his left, depart from me. You who are cursed into eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing. Listen to Jesus. He said, I was. I was. Do you remember when he walked on the earth? Hey, what you eating? He just invited himself in. Hey, Zacchaeus, come down out of that tree. Today, I'm having supper with you. He invited himself in. When did I? When did I? When did I? Mm. All through scripture. Amen. He was like a walking around going, all right, let's see who understands this. Mm. They'll answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, a stranger, and eating clothes, sick or in prison, and did not help? He'll reply, truly, I tell you, whatever you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you didn't do it for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Whew. Wow. That's sober, isn't it? So what I'm looking for is the least of these. I got to find the least of these. I got to start inviting. I got to start connecting. Amen. I got, and this is, what, this is on me. This is on me. So when I walk in and I do a funeral, yesterday when I did that funeral, I preached this. I found out I could about preach anything at a funeral. I, I, preached, I preached out of the four guys that brought the one. I talked. I did at the wedding yesterday. I can't help myself. I'm reaching. I'm reaching. I want to see people know Jesus. Amen. Stand with me. God, I want to give you thanks. Because I didn't know how I'd say this this morning. I didn't know how it would come out. But I stand before a receptive people that have a mandate on them to find the least of these. To go after men and bring them in. To go after women and bring them in. 
God, we're not looking to label people. We're looking to see them become sons and daughters of the King. I thank you for the Word of God that straightens me out. It's like a mirror I look into. God, I thank you. The Lord, in the name of Jesus, with heads bowed and eyes closed, there can't be anybody leave this building that don't know you. I can't allow it to happen. But I got to stand here all day and bar them doors. So if you are not sure that you could shine and get away from hell and give your life to Jesus and go to heaven, if you ain't sure, slip your hand up right now and back down. Ain't nobody going to beat you up in here. We just want to pray with you. You're not sure, hand up and back down. That's what I thought. Everybody in here, okay. Okay. Let's just make it sure. In our hands. Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I want to be your child. Call me son. Call me daughter. Take away the labels. Take away my past. Give me my future. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right, now come on, give God praise in here. Hallelujah. I charge you in the name of Jesus to take this message and use it. Stop labeling people. Stop labeling your kids. Mm -mm, mm -mm. I will not be described as a label that was put on me years ago. I'm born again. The cross made the difference. The blood washed away my sins. Amen. I stand redeemed, a son of God, as you do as sons and daughters. Amen. Amen. Now, you got to go get somebody. You know, the neat thing is today is you ain't got to drag them on a mat. You can put them in your truck. Amen. You can you get people there. This coming, this coming week, 10 o'clock. You have to be there before 10 o'clock. Bring your grub in. Amen. I want to make sure that we got plenty of food for guys. Invite men. Go after them. Look, it's pretty simple. We're going to shoot guns. They're going to be archery. They're going to be horseshoes. They're going to be a beanbag toss. I can't use that other word. It bothers me. Amen. They'll be washers. They're going to be uh, basketball. They, we're going to, uh, you know, there's gifts and prizes for everyone. I'm giving away a Henry rifle. Uh, Texas edition. This thing is gorgeous. Octagon barrel. Gold. Uh, it's beautiful, man. You know, and it's just a giveaway. But you got to be at 10 o'clock to get it. You got to be there to get the ticket. You ain't show up at 12 o'clock. They ain't going to give you no ticket at 12 o'clock. I don't care what your excuse is. You show up, you start off with us. Amen. Right. They're going to be, a, a, David Hilton's going to give us a motivational speech about being men. We're going to have a great time. Amen. We got ladies who are going to be helping serve in the kitchen. So they they excited about that. Martha, Martha. Amen. Got to have Martha in the house. Can I get an amen? Without Martha, without Martha, Mark ain't got nothing. Amen. You need Martha. So we're going to have that taking place. So please show up. Amen. And then that Sunday morning, we start again with uh, Don Metcalf. Pastor Don from Pigeon Forge, Tennessee will be with us. A man of tremendous tenacity, perseverance. You've never heard a story like this man who tried to start a church. Well, it started a great church in Los Angeles, but what he went through. He's a man who's stigmatized by uh, birth defect in his eyes. He's walked through it. People have tried to label him. They've looked at him as somehow he was, he's probably the most intelligent man I've ever met. Wow. But here's a man who's walked through it, dealt with life. Amen. He's got stories of victory to share with us next week at our spring conference. Be seated for a brief moment as our servant leaders come up. If you're watching online, please. You'll see this online, so you want to make sure that you tag it, send it out. Guys, if you don't have one of these, they're back there on the, the bar on the way out. Uh, pick up. There's some small flowers like this, the Beast Feast. To get the word out, you can leave them at uh, places of business so folk can catch hold of it. David has some other announcements here. If you need a tithe or offer an envelope, lift your hand. Amen. Thank you for your faithfulness in giving. Don't, don't let this church go down financially. Let's keep this up. Amen. If you're not a tither, start asking God, give me faith that I can believe you for my finances 
Amen. And watch and see what God does. Give and it shall be given. Now this here we gave you a couple of weeks ago. We want to put new flooring in the back of the church. So it has to do with you being able to give over and above over the next six months. If you've got this, turn it in, please. If you don't have one, you can also pick up one of those. We're not going to hound you over it. We're just trying to see how much our budget's going to be in order to make sure we can get the flooring in. Hallelujah. Well, did the preacher preach today? Y'all good? Tell somebody about it. It's on holywild.tv that they can watch that. My mom watches it. Others I know watch it. We want to just get the word out and use this. It's a great avenue to use. Amen. David. Amen. So next week, obviously, we, like we've been talking about, we have the Beast Feast. Guys, I mean, we can't put an emphasis on this enough. We've put it out on Facebook. We put it out. We're creating an opportunity for you to be able to tell your friends, to be able to get them in a position where their lives could be changed. My question is, do you love them? That's it. That's as simple as you can say. That message today is, do you love the people around you enough to tell them about Jesus? That simple. And so I, I just encourage you this week, love your friends, your brothers, your uncles, your dads, your nephews, sons, whomever. They, they belong here, and they belong in the kingdom with us forever. March 1st through the 4th is our conference. Um, Pastor just talked about that. Uh, in the back, we do need this. We need, uh, for conference, cookies, sandwiches, and desserts. Miss Cheryl. Oh, Okay, did y'all catch that? Tuesday is, uh, Sunday is cookies. Tuesday is sandwiches, cakes, and pies. And there's a sign up in the back so that way we know and we can kind of direct toward like we don't need 4,000 pies and no sandwiches. So we got, man, yeah. <laughs> Sam huh? might want 4,000 pies and no, no sandwiches. <laughs> Sam gonna need a lot of milk. <laughs> y'all go, y'all better get the milk out. Um, so. Uh, that's that's to help the ladies in the back so they know how to uh, facilitate that. So please sign up in the back. March 21st, uh, TLCC kid, uh, Kids Daddy Daughter Dance. Um, it's going to be an Aloha Daddy Daughter Luau Dance. Sign up in the back of the church. Kids ages three years old through the sixth grade in the chapel uh, in New Candy. 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. See Miss Marley for details. I'm sure she's going to be here in the next couple weeks. Uh, that's a good time. I took my daughter last year. She was a little too young, but... She begged and begged and begged, so I begged uh, Miss Marley to allow us to go. It was, it was a lot of fun, and my daughter has not forgot it since. Since then, she has continued to say, Daddy, when are we going to Daddy Daughter Dance? Daddy, when are we going to So if you do this, you will forever make a memory in your daughter's lives. Uh, April 5th is going to be Muscle Car Sunday. Begin to prepare for that in your minds and, and begin to tell people. Uh, April 18th is our, um, it's a fundraiser, and I don't know anything about that other than it's going to be a fundraiser for our kids. Anybody out there know anything about that? Car wash and bake sale. So that's two things. What's the third? Thank you. See, I knew there had to be something. It said trifecta. I mean, it had to be three. So uh, garage sale, bake sale, car wash for the, for the art trip, April 18th. That's going to be fun. Um, Guys, I'm excited about what we have coming up. I hope you guys are too. Hope you buy into what he talked about today because that yeah. can literally change people's lives. Yeah. Today, uh, if you did you already ask if you need a time offer? Good. Today, we're believing God for jobs and better jobs. More money, less hours. Benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and return, debts to mall, royalties received, Favor, success to the kingdom. Why don't you turn? 